getting cold again now it's like tropical spring uh, the past couple days it's so weird eh? when you go to that transition especially when you live in the mountains it'll go from absolutely extreme freezing cold arctic conditions and then uh, the very next day everybody's got a t-shirt on <laughs> but anyway so i just took this poor old quad for a burn up out of the back 40. it's funny this poor thing I should say, poor thing. These Yamaha quads, they go for freaking ever. It's ridiculous. I don't have any of my friends went out and dumped, you know, 10, 12 grand on a brand new quad and uh, possibly went through a couple quads. And I've had this old heater the whole time. It's never, uh, they just don't quit. I don't know why. And I'm not nice to my stuff. <laughs> I'm not nice to trucks. Same thing with trucks. Friends always bug me. Will you buy a brand new truck? And I'm like, what the hell for? I'm going to beat the shit out of it and use it. For what it is, it's a truck. Same as a quad. Anyway, uh, so where am I right now? That's the Mount Curry uh, community back behind me. And for a, a couple of novelty points, that little bit lake is straight back behind me in the valley. And just to my right, I might swing the camera up there in a second. But just to my right is where twice last year year ago year and a half ago twice a quote large male sasquatch first the first person that told me it was spotted was from a logging truck log truck driver a guy that works anyway either way it's a guy that works the logger i know directly told him that he saw this thing cross the road right there where are we is the crow flies probably basically crossed the road right behind about that looks to be about 700 yards right there and then again that july august name september i was on working a job site just up in owl ridge and google that one up owl creek there's a few uh first nations guys in the job site and a handful of people in the community were at a bit of an uproar because this same probably the same one what blatantly walked from the birkenhead river across that road right behind me I think he had two hands, full, two hands full of fish and walked right across the road in front of something like eight adults, or no, four adults and four kids or something like that, broad daylight, and just glanced at him like he owned the joint. For all you people that that makes angry that I'm sharing that because you don't think this is true, well, sucks to be you. You don't have to accept the facts. So anyway, and even the teenagers around here, which I, I, I haven't spoke to them on this topic at all, and they have said numerous times, you do not go up here in the dark where I am right now. That's just the word of the street. You don't go up here at nighttime. There you go. I'll flash the camera up there and show you guys the backdrop here. But there's a long, long history of these beings, especially in this valley behind me, basically every valley that connects to here. The Pemberton Valley, the Sea to Sky Corridor from Vancouver to Whistler, Whistler to here here at the Pemberton Meadows, from here all the way out to Gold Bridge, here to Lillooet, and here south, this, this drain behind me, if you look at it on the map, it goes all the way out to Harrison, ends at Harrison Hot Springs, right? And we all know the history down there. So everywhere I am in these connected valleys is basically a thoroughfare travel route, home, residency, whatever. Whatever it is, it is what it is, and there is literally thousands of... Uh, reports that go on right where I am and all around me and there's no way out of it there's nothing you can do to change it there's no human being you can shame to change that you can't assassinate anybody's character to change it nothing's going to change it what is changing is the people becoming aware of the honest truth and the honest facts which are going on right but anyway oh, I'm sitting here on my comfy little perch didn't even have to hike today crazy Let's see what I got besides, I mean, what is it right now? It is March 4th. It's March 4th. And just in the March 
folder so far, there's 107 unread emails which have been sent in to me this month alone, and I haven't copied them all. And I haven't copied them all for every single month previous either. It's a little crazy. Or maybe it isn't crazy. Maybe we're just crazy because we don't know. So you might have to put up some of the background sounds of everyday life going on as I read this. Hello, Steve. Been watching your videos for a while now and love them. I live in Sacramento, California. I don't hunt, but I fish for trout in a few mountain lakes near me in the mountains and ride my enduro motorcycle on the fire roads. Love being out in the tall pine trees. I love nature. We go out we go up for the day to hang out sometimes and shoot our guns and bows and during summer do some camping. One day, me and my daughter went out for a day scout at a lake called French Meadows Reservoir. It was a few years ago when the fires were nearby. We checked out the campground and kept driving around the lake. There's a stream on the right that fed into the lake and I went for a swim in that creek that had a swimming hole. I was really on the lookout because we were pretty far out and didn't see no one all the frickin' day. We didn't carry our weapons then but now I do. Anyway, we continued down the dirt road a little further and was standing outside the car just talking and I felt the ground rumble. I'm like, Jackie, be quiet. Do you feel that? She's like, no. The next thing I know, something across the dirt road behind the thick trees went whoop, whoop, kind of loud. We just looked at each other and said, let's get the hell out of here. I've watched all those YouTube documentaries and have been learning about these creatures for over seven years now, so I knew what those sounds were. Even when I went fishing at Stumpy Meadows Reservoir, I heard it was trying to sound like an owl right when I walked up to throw my poles out. It was on the side of the hill. It was like an alarm went off. Hoo, 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 for like two minutes, straight and loud too. It couldn't have been an owl. It was like if I tried to sound like an owl, but louder. I left to grab something from the car. When I came back, there's a couple of people fishing by me. And I said, did you guys hear that owl up there? They said, no. So it stopped as soon as they arrived. I've also seen stick structures up in Mount Shasta, hacking to a waterfall in a lake called Castle Lake, which is on the north side of Castle Crags, a big ass mountain made out of stone that looks like a castle. I also seen a strange stick structure across the river by Lake Tahoe. When we were cutting our Christmas tree, it was overlooking a camp. I think these things like to observe people. The lake near my house, about an hour away, is a normal place I go called Sugar Pine Reservoir. One day I went out and took my kayak out and just went across the lake a short distance to where the shade was. It was hotter than hell that day. I got out of the kayak and my little dog William was with me, a miniature dash hound, and we were resting in the shade and I was drinking a beer and I started to look around and there was sticks stacked in weird ways and the bottom branches of the trees were pushed down to create a shelter. It looked like I was in their kickback spot and maybe a lookout spot for them because this spot was right across from the boat ramp and wasn't that easy for me to get to because it was kind of a cliff. I had a hard time getting out of the kayak and on land but it was so hot I wanted shade, probably 100 degrees. Also many times I've observed dead silence and will say to my friends, listen, where is all the squirrels, birds, etc. I mean dead quiet a few times. Anyway, Steve, there's a few other things I've experienced and observed. It is not much, but it is, for me, it's enough to make me smarter when I go out now. I'll send you my photos I took of the structure I found. Have a great day. And keep those videos coming, Steve. Every morning I listen to my coffee. Thanks for listening, everyone. Nisa. Yeah, those are kind of different. I'll definitely add those in. And uh, thank you very much for sending that in. Um, I guarantee you, everyone appreciates that that effort. Because believe me, sending emails isn't easy. And sending a text for me isn't easy these days. I, yeah. Well, this looks like it wants to get rainy. I'm going to keep this ball rolling. What do we got? No borders. Oh, no, that's red. It's actually not Sasquatch related. I got halfway through it and realized it wasn't uh, an important experience shared. Important right now because a lot of these people need to be heard, heard you guys, a lot. And uh, people that are troubled, and that's who we're trying to focus on. Another from Louisiana. Hey, Steve, first off, thanks for what you're doing for this topic. After 31 years of silence, I'm finally going to pull my balls out of my pocket and tell my story. 
There's a lot of people that are doing the same thing. A lot. And so good for you. Back in 1990, I was an RV mechanic in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I overheard two of my co-workers slash friends talking about going camping and looking for Bigfoot again. Due to a previous experience they have had at this particular spot, just outside of Alexandria, Louisiana. They asked if I wanted to go and I said, hell yeah. We loaded up the beer and the 12 gauge and went off, Randy, John, and myself. Fast forward a day and a half later, the woods are across about a 20 acre field from Randy's in-laws home. We drove across the field and hiked out about 50 yards into the woods. We set up camp and was accompanied by a black lab that followed us from the in-laws house. We were sitting around the fire and Randy said, you smell that? He's here, approximately 10 p.m. About the same time the smell hit John and myself, the dog was not moving a muscle, just frozen in place. It would never come into the sight of our crappy 1980s flashlights or campfire. It would come and go for the next four or five hours, never coming into view. Sometime well after midnight, we all dozed off. We woke to the dog going insane, and just 15 feet away past the campfire was a Bigfoot running back into the dark. We all saw it. It was in camp with us. The dog, the dog must have said, screw this crap. He headed back to the house at full sprint and left us hanging. The rest of the night, the smell never left. As day started to break, we could see not one, but multiple silhouettes stand up on two legs. We watched, and at least five of these things walked into the deep woods out of sight along with the smell. We left and never went back again. Daryl. Five of them. Man. Okay, Daryl, thanks. Thanks for sending that in. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, that's one, one of the creepy, creepy, uh, points about these things is how they do that. I don't understand it. I, there's so many things that I don't understand because I understand a lot. I always, I am so well versed with all the game animals around here in the Northern Rockies and where I guide. It's ridiculous. I know almost every single thing about them, what they do, when they do it, how they do it and where to find them and how they react to different situations. But, uh, it is absolutely beyond me why numerous of these beings intentionally creep up on us. I don't get it. I honestly don't get it. Because on, on average, your average experience and witness account, these things do not want anything to do with us when we see them, and they run like hell, like they're about to get assassinated. So it's just such a contradicting reaction. It's a contradicting thing personality trait whatever you want to call it i just don't get it how can something so big and so intimidating display that they do not want anything to do with us they don't want to be seen by us they especially do not want to be looked at by us yet they'll turn around and crawl in their bellies right up beside us around a campfire or in a camp it just makes sense right tell me i'm wrong but it just does not make... That's very, very confusing to me when you're trying to make sense of... of uh, potentially make sense of, of these beings, right? But I think as we're probably all learning together, there is a lot more running around out there than just your typical Sasquatch being, right? It's such a crazy, crazy frickin' reality going on on this round ball sharing it with us it's so funny how many people are, are will dedicate their entire lives to this topic too right <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty crazy to see the different reactions from different human beings some people don't want anything to do with it some people it, it it makes them rage because they do not even want it spoken about they do not want it to even remotely be close to being factual and then you get other people who dedicate their entire lives to investigating them and they want to viciously attack other people who have already accepted the existence of these things but they want to viciously attack them for not believing what they believe when it comes to exactly what these things are or what they can or can't do and then these people go at war with each other <laughs> right human beings are very peculiar how many times have i said that to everybody I'm actually more amazed at watching how human beings react in this lifetime than I am this the fact that these things are real at this stage of the game. 
But anyway, well, let's see who's next. What's next? What are we? Who's got something we can learn from here? Family settings and food for thought. Dear Steve, although I'm not as qualified as some of the others that have sent you the tales of these beings, I figured I would throw in my chips anyway. I first want to say thanks for your efforts and stance on the topic. It's rare nowadays for someone to fight back, as it were. Too many people wearing blinders and not thinking about things. How to think, not what to think. Yeah? I hope this isn't too excru excruciatingly long if you do read it, but there have been quite a few events around us, and I'm going to try to hit a few of them. Use grammar and separate them to make them easier to read. If you want any extra details on anything, just throw me a message back. I'd be happy to help. And thank you so much for doing the, gra the grammar and punctuation. My name's Brett. My name's Brett Myers. I don't mind if you use my name. Most of these stories take place in a small town called Otter Lake in Michigan. It's just southeast of Millington, Michigan, which is another email you read. I spent much of my life in and out of the woods in an area between fishing and camping and adventuring. Growing up, my family used to tell me stories of my grandpa's campground back in the 70s, 80s near Columbiaville, Michigan, where a woman described a pair of bears, a big one and a little one, that stood watching her and her kids swimming in the lake. Grandpa had to explain to her that there aren't any bear around here and that bear don't stand up like that without reason. The campground had a common unique happening where they would find garbage bags open and had been rummaged through. Garbage bags that had been tied shut and hung 10 feet in the air to keep it from animals. My mom used to tell me that it used to come and breathe in her window at the campground in the middle of the night. She told her dad about it and he told her to get, come get him if it did happen again. My grandpa served D-Day and wasn't afraid of much. The next night, it returned, and she eventually worked up the courage to go to him. We went out to confront whatever it was. Nothing was there. The breathing stopped after that. My dad, right after he met my mom, was at the campground helping cut firewood with my cousin. They heard a scream from the south that sounded like a woman being skinned alive. It was loud and frightening enough to make my cousin almost leave my dad behind in the truck. My cousin is six foot seven. He used to carry small engines around on his shoulders. My dad said he has never seen him that scared. In most recent years, I personally have had the being watched feeling many times, specifically when I've been working in my shop. One end of the building is open air and is maybe 15 feet from 80 acres of forest and swamp. I'm a bladesmith, working with noise, canceling headphones on and using grinders or hammering out a piece. People can walk up on you pretty easily. But when it gets late, I've been hit with a wave of stop strong enough to pull my attention from my grinding and listening to music. It's always from that open air end of the shop near the woods. I usually take that as my, it's time to go inside for the night QU. But the real story is when my friend John and I were out at the shop working on a few projects and we both noticed a subtle feeling of being watched from that end of the shop. He is a firm believer in the paranormal and tries to listen when things don't make sense. So we packed up and headed for the house. We both noticed that it was that eerie kind of dark that happens sometimes. So dark it seems alive, you know? We got to the front porch and stood talking. Being loud, too loud, it woke my ma and she came and told us to quieten down. Being 1 a.m., we said our goodbyes. John turned to leave and I called my dog Luke. He's a lab slash beagle mix, super curious and stubborn. Luke is trained to come to a specific whistle, and he did but he stopped and turned around when that same whistle was mimicked from the direction of my shop. John stopped and looked at me. My hair went up on my neck and I called Luke again, but Luke was slowly walking toward the whistle, hair up, tail straight up, and he kept looking from the whistle to me and back again. Finally, he came to me and I put him inside. Me, angry that something is trying to attract my dog. I got my flashlight and with John backing me up, we went toward the whistle came from but all we found was a screech owl having a fit, flying around as if something was disturbing its nighttime prowlings. We watched for the better part of 30 minutes. Nothing else happened, and the whole atmosphere calmed down. I've also seen a pair of red eyes around the area a few times. The most distinct was when I stopped in town to observe a herd of deer that was crossing the road and were spread out across the adjacent cornfield. With scanning the field with my flashlight, a 1500 lumen spotlight from my truck window. Mesmerized by the fifty or so deer around me, behind the herd on a small berm and overlooking them was a pair of red eyes. I held the flashlight on them for a minute or so and they never looked away. I slowly scanned away to the left to see if anything else was there and when I scanned back, the eyes were gone. 
This is unsettling, more so because when I got back to my parents' house, which was in sight of the other side of this field, you could hear the deer bleeding and running. Bleating and running. I don't know what it was or could have been, but it makes you think a little, if nothing else. Anyways, I won't keep you any longer again. Apologies for the long email. I can ramble on this topic for a good while. Wish you and yours well, brother. Keep up the good work. Much respect to you. Thank you for all you do. Sincerely, Brett Myers. Right on, Brett. Thank you so much for sending that in. And it's never, ever a problem. And it's never too long, right? As long as something in there possibly helps somebody else, whether it be around your immediate community or somewhere else, you never know, right? But this is the only way the truth's going to get out. And this is, as well, one of the basically the only ways anybody's ever going to get get assisted. Well, we got some chainsaws flashing up behind me. Continental poles back behind me. These guys that make log packages for home. So I guess that should be expected. And it's funny. They had, uh, I know some kids that were walking up the, the paved road there and saw one of these things standing in the swamp right behind that pole yard behind me a few years ago. Here we go again. Oh, this is local. All right, here we go. Hello, Steve. My name is Eldon. I used to live in Squamish, B.C. I worked for highways and also worked out of Pemberton and all the way up past Darcy, which is that way. First, I'd like to say we're big supporters of what you stand for and how you do it. I can go on and on, but I will, I'll get right to it. When I grew up, my family big believers in Sasquatch. However, we turned teenagers in 1980. So with all of us youth walking all over the res and in the bush where we live in Manitoba, we forgot all about what was filmed in Bluff Creek. We've got some major wind now. Got to cover this microphone, I think. So I guess we figured there was only one and it must be dead. We all walked the bushes, not even to think about Bigfoot. So in 2002, I moved to Squamish. After seeing people in many places hiking or camping, or even living way out in the boonies of BC, I never gave Sasquatch a thought whatsoever. So one night, on my days off from highways, I worked for a local trucking company that had a contract to haul supplies to Tapella and Point Douglas, Port Douglas, for the hydro project. That's straight down the valley behind me. This was around 2009, 2010 maybe. I was returning, and I was between Skookumchuk and the little, and the little Lillooet Lake. I had a dual flat deck Super B tractor trailer, empty. It was about 1.15 and 1.45 in the morning. Beautiful black warm summer night in early July. You know that road along the river and how the bush is right up against the road. Not much roadway for shoulders. Well, my last set of wheels at the rear end were locking up, starving for air. We had a shutoff valve before the wheels, and sometimes it bounced closed. Ah, we always forgot about it, because once back in the pavement, it wouldn't happen. Anyway, I stopped my truck at this little single narrow gravel road. I take my tension bar just in case a cougars or a bear, I figure. It's all I had. It's a long way to the back of the tractor and two trailers. So I go back and crawl under, under to open the valve. You hear the brakes open up. Yes. I thought, all good. <laughs> this wind's starting to rip. I don't know if this microphone's getting blasted in too much wind or not. Let's try this. Yes, I thought, all good. Just as I was to finish that thought, as I was crawling out, that unbelievable ugly feeling came on me instantly. The feeling you hear many tell about. Scared like something is there behind me. I stood up. I won't look. I contemplated jump. I contemplated jumping up on the trailers and run to the front, but I realized I have to get down to jump in the rig. So being First Nation, and I don't know how to sing, or if I do try to sing, I sound like a sick dog probably, lol. So the only noise I could make was to try to sing powwow song, and I don't even know how to sing that. But I started off to the front of the rig, bouncing my bar off the trailers like I was drumming, all the while was singing at high almost yell. It seemed like forever to get to the rig, and leaves almost touching my face on my left. All the while I can sense this thing was right behind me, all the way. Eerie, ugly frickin' feeling. I made it in my truck, I put it in gear, same time as I was taking off, I kept sounding the big air horn between shifts. I spit out of there, but not enough to make me crash. No way did I want to spend a night out there. No, I didn't hear anything. The rapids just giving her right there as there was lots of rain that week. 
It happened to my dad, that feeling. Him and I went to the old farm, the time I felt nothing, but he did. I don't know how and why, all I truly believe was that if it turned around, this thing could have had me. It's funny this, remembering this experience after I heard you telling the story about a dirt biker that broke down across the river, and somewhere is like that around there, and somewhere is like around where I was. I told my honey, listen to Steve tell this story. I didn't say what it was about. Then after he said this, dirt biker seen three Sasquatch across the river past the bridge. Just after he said, just after he said that, my honey blurts out to me, hey, isn't that right around where you felt the presence? You were on the other side of the river where those Sasquatches were. I said, yeah, somewhere real close to there, yes. Feel free to share my story. I know some of guys from highways or the guys who drove delivering the, for the trucking company will know about this experience because I told them all about it when it happened. I said, whatever you guys want to make of it, whatever. I'm just saying. I wasn't alone, and whatever was there wasn't normal. So just remember that when you go back there, as for me, I stuck to day trips after that. I have more stories from Manitoba experiences. I'll share another time. Feel free to use my name and where I'm from. Till we speak again, we with you, Steve. Thank you, Eldon from Manitoba. There you go. Thanks, Eldon. Appreciate that. And uh, there's one little part that was not really messed, left out, but there's the part that the guy, that kid that, you know, he's not really a kid now, I'd imagine, but when he broke down his dirt bike down that road, straight down the valley behind me. He got a picture of these three things with a cell phone. And uh, like I said before, my farrier, he saw the photo. And he said, there's no way those things are human. And uh, he, they were on the other side of the, of the river from him, staring and looking at him. And again, I just haven't gotten around to going out and hunting this guy down to see if he'll share the picture. I don't know. You know me and my stance in the photos. Here's what it is. It, it doesn't matter. You could you could put a probably put a frickin' video up on on the line and one of these things bleeding out and it's not gonna make any difference. To people who scoff at or ridicule others about the existence of these things. This it's not that's people just gotta stop engaging with those people. There's so much evidence proving that this is going on. Like I I am nothing. I am nothing about trying to prove anything. The proof's out. At this stage of the game if your brain can't wrap around it, it's only your personal issues. It's your issues. That's all there is to it. Like I said earlier, just because your brain can't wrap around it doesn't mean it's not true. All right? And uh, this shit's going on. But, yeah, that's why I – photographs don't really motivate. I, I know where as well that where there is another man in front of me where there is some other photographs that a guy took of these things, a bunch of them apparently, and that's just up the road from me here too. And it is what it is. I'd have to go out of my way, hunt the people down, see if I can have access, get the photographs, share them online, get laughed at, and carry on. <laughs> right? But I think what I'm doing right now is more... I'm more motivated to do what I'm doing right now. It's just getting all these voices heard, all right, and making sure that every single one of you knows that you got a safe place to share this shit, nobody's going to laugh at you, and you know what's going on, and you're not crazy. That's the main thing. Um... And every single one of you people that have had had this experience, you probably don't need a photograph, do you? 